having an appreciation and a little bit of understanding of maintenance of what's possible. Not that you have to do that, but you're just going to be a better consumer to work with those professionals and kind of push back a little bit because, yeah, there's been some really bad ideas uh, given to me by professionals and it's one way to fix the problem. But one, it's probably a little higher cost initially and maintenance isn't even a consideration. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener, thank you for being back for another episode. The title of today's episode is How to Maintain Your Rental Property. This is an interview with Scott Dixon. He is a YouTuber at Everyday Home Repairs, and he has millions of views, over 500,000 subscribers, and he makes videos about how to do repairs on your house. And that could be your own home that you live in. It could be your rental properties. He also wears another hat where he is a small and mighty investor. He has nine units over five properties. So a couple of those are multi-unit properties that he's self-managed and also maintained for many years now. So he has a really unique perspective as someone who does the business as a real estate investor, as a landlord, and also handles a lot of the maintenance and understands it well. So whether you're someone who wants to do the maintenance yourself or just you're a rental owner more like me who outsources it to other people but want to understand how to do it, how much it should cost, what the process is. In today's episode, we talk all about rental properties and specifically, we, after we talking about his story and how he got to his point where he has these properties, we talk about some best practices, the types of properties you can buy that reduce your maintenance cost, the types of repairs you want to do to make your property be a good rental, and all sorts of other de details in between. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Scott Dixon. Before we get to this week's interview, it's time for the weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me in my real estate investing, finances, or business behind the scenes. So as you get this episode, or at least as it's published, it's going to be the new year, 2023. So I just want to wish you a happy new year for me and my family, just to give you a little life update on where we are. We have been in Granada, Spain since July of 2022. And as I'm recording this, it's been a really positive experience. Some of my goals have not been business related so much, although I am writing a book called The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. That's been my focus for the last four or five months or so. If you're on my newsletter list, I've been keeping you updated and sharing snippets of that. And I'm pushing hard towards the end to try to get a deadline that was right at the end of the year to, to write the book and to get it finished. And hopefully that's going to come together pretty nicely. I'm real happy with where it's going so far. And I'll keep you updated throughout 2023. It should be published in August of 2023, but I'll have some opportunities to get some early copies and to support me if you're willing to buy some early copies and share it with your friends. That would mean the world to me. So I will stay in touch with you about that. The other things I'm doing just personally, this has been a big kind of sp a Spanish language learning journey for me. I've in the past gotten intermediate level Spanish and I've been really trying to break through that and have even more than just conversational, be able to have more detailed, more nuanced conversations. So I've been taking Spanish classes every week. I've been participating in just local groups to practice my Spanish and get the local, you know, local accent and understand the way people speak in a regional dialect here in Granada. And that's been going well. And my goal has been to actually do an interview or do a YouTube video or multiple uh, videos in Spanish. So I'll keep you updated on that. Don't have any announcements on that yet, but I have a couple things in the works. And but otherwise, just this has been, I want to encourage you, whether you want to travel abroad or do what we're doing, to pursue some of your what matters type dreams. This show is all about doing what matters for me and my family, traveling, spending time with family. My kids are 11 and nine. So they're just at an age where spending a lot of time with them and doing something different is fun for us and kind of part of our value system and what we're trying to accomplish. You have your own things, you have your own goals. So in 2023, I just wanna encourage you to set those goals and to shoot for them to use real estate investing, your personal finances as a tool to help you accomplish them. Because that's really what it's all about. And I wish you nothing but the best in 2023. Now let's get started with today's interview with Scott Dixon. Hey, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Hey, Chad, appreciate it, man. Looking forward to the, the talk. Yeah, me too. This is this is going to be a talk about different real estate investing topics. I, I definitely want to go deep and pick your brain on all things 
property maintenance, doing it yourself, hiring it out, what's it look like with your channel, YouTube channel, which I hope everybody will check out every day, home repairs. I'm a fan, I'm a subscriber, I'm a learner. I go on this channel to learn about how to, how to do, do things with properties that I don't know how to do, or, I, or if I'm asking somebody else to do it, I check out Scott's channel. So I have a link to that uh, in the video description, pod, podcast description. But I would love, Scott, just to let everybody get to know you a little bit better before we get into some of the technical details. And I would, I would, maybe let's just start back in your, your professional career. You were an engineer working for mm -hmm. the corp corporation. So maybe let's start there and kind of go forward and talk to me a little bit about your experience there. Cool, yeah. Um, about 15 years in corporate. So I was a standard corporate guy, went to Big Ten University, did engineering, um, and it was basically machinery. So I worked for Caterpillar for 12 years. That was really my, my whole career was Caterpillar designing, testing, and, and really all about uh, heavy equipment. So construction equipment, mining equipment. Um, I was on equipment quite a bit. So I was taking data from equipment. I would, I'd be in a, you know, in the cab of a wheel loader uh, with my laptop, taking data, tuning the hydraulics, and just kind of nerding out on the, on the processors and the data of equipment. <clears throat> so did that for a long time with design and then also testing these machines. Um, kind of slowly started going through the ranks, you know, and getting a team and kind of developing internal products. Um, but during that whole process, really from the start, I always had a little bit of an itch of an entrepreneurial itch and I was kind of exploring and, and um, really back in 08, kind of right when the market started to turn, I was, I was rich dad, poor dad, the classics, right? Like rich dad, poor dad. This was before bigger pockets. This was before the, the podcast. Uh, I was consuming Sean Terry on wholesaling side of things, Jason Hartman uh, with creating wealth. So I was getting into podcasting really before anybody knew what that was, I was consuming. Uh, and then, literally bigger pockets came on the scene then and i kind of followed through every you know every one of their podcasts early, early days and that got me in the mindset of you know the cash flow quadrant from robert kiyosaki i'm exchanging i'm exchanging my time for income that's going to have a cap how can we you know how can we get our capital or talents uh working for us you know and that's where real estate came in i started to explore that Love it. Well, I just, I just got to have tell you an aside, like what a cool job. When I, when I think about my five-year-old self or my four-year-old self who was playing yeah. with Caterpillar trucks in the sandbox, like to think, to think about that, I would know someday somebody who was like building those same trucks. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, great. it's crazy. I spent time in uh, Tucson, Arizona, a testing facility. And it was like 5,000 acres, yellow equipment. As far as I can see, it actually wow. is pretty similar to like like what a childhood dream would be, yeah. you know, I'm climbing staircases up to a, a 993K or 994K wheel loader. That's like the cabs, like two and a half stories in the air, you know? Um, you know, you got a real truck when you have to climb a ladder to get into it or the, or the yeah. tractor, right? That's, no, that's the real stair deal. Staircase, not <laughs> staircase. even like a vertical ladder, like a angled staircase. Yeah. Oh man. So, yeah. So, so that was a lot of fun. I was, super passionate about it, you know, during my corporate career. So, and, and just in terms of, I always love hearing about how people transfer skills. And I, I know a lot of engineers who've become great real estate investors. And I feel like that analytical, hey, I could take this thing apart and figure this thing out. If, if you do that with one thing, this in this case, a, a Caterpillar piece of machinery, you can also do that with a piece of real estate. You can do that with a how to analyze finances. So you, you started getting this itch to be an entrepreneur, to do, do that, did, did you just jump straight into it? Did you have a process? Like what was some of the evolution for you to actually dip your toes in the real estate world? Yeah, I wasn't as, so the numbers obviously were not an issue in terms of making my spreadsheet, running the numbers, making sure, you know, it, it cash flowed and, and then some. Uh, your first purchase is, is often your worst purchase. <laughs> so, you know, I would never buy that, that first duplex that I, that, you know, before house hacking was a thing that I was house hacking. Um, but it got me started. It got me into that mindset. Um, and so I went through and analyzed, but really it was just taking action. I've always been one to jump in, get my feet in the trenches 
and then learn a little bit as I go. So yes, apply those analytical skills, apply uh, some hands-on capability, like apply what, you know, what I can do in terms of fixing it myself and maybe uh, getting some leverage there where my maintenance costs aren't quite as, as high or I can reduce my capital expenditures. So, but just really getting into it, um, I think I, I never had a problem with, you know, analysis paralysis where I was really just diving into the numbers and couldn't do anything with it. But I do, talking to new real estate investors that want to get in, involved and get started, you should have some like unfair advantage, right? There should be something that you can point to, whether it is your analytical skills, whether it's your deal flow, whether it's your ability to fix things. Maybe you come from the construction market, maybe you come from a trade, maybe your father was a home builder, um, you have an amazing team, whatever that is, you should be able to point to something. You know, if you can't point to something, especially in 2022, as we as we talk, it's going to be tough, right? Like, yeah. where where are you where are you getting that cash flow? Where are you getting that margin in that deal? If you're buying from the MLS, you're paying retail prices for everything. Uh, for instance, you know, maybe in my market, I can do some electrical work and save some money. Or maybe I have a guy who's reasonably priced at fifty dollars an hour. But if I'm calling the premium electrician, that's one hundred and sixteen dollars an hour for that work, right? So where's my margin coming in? And I think that's where a lot of people fail. It's you know it's not that easy, right? Real estate isn't that easy where you yeah. can just buy anything and make it work. Um, so that's really my focus was where is my unfair advantage? And it was a little more in the kind of getting dirty, right? The hands-on skills and and taking on some of that responsibility, both from a maintenance and management standpoint. Mm. Yeah, I love it. I really love this idea of the competitive advantage. And in your case, you kind of got your hands dirty. You jumped in, you're yep. dealing with the properties themselves. You weren't intimidated by that. You were, in fact, probably interested in it, curious about how this thing works. And so you you, you did that. And I want to point out, just because I love this idea, other investors I've known, some of them have been, you know, the, the hands-on handyman. Let's just get this, fix this stuff. In my own case, just to give a counter example, I'm, I'm not very good at that and not as interested in it. But I've had a competitive advantage as a communicator, as a negotiator, and even right. when I wasn't, then I wasn't very polished, wasn't, didn't know how to do it. I, I would just go out. I wasn't afraid to go out and just knock on doors and talk to people and make offers and and learn. I was a learner. Um, so there, there's lots of there's lots of different competitive advantages. Uh, you mentioned a couple, you know, being being willing to do repairs, being really good at the numbers, being right. willing to communicate. Um, I, I'm also thinking right. those people who are buying it at retail and maybe have a full time job and good credit. Your competitive advantage these days, and interest rates have gone up. But if you can get 30 year fixed financing while having right. a job and putting it, having a down payment, you know that's all for a period of time. That's a competitive advantage, which is just something. Is that, is that how you also got your first deals? Were you with your W two income saving the down payment, 100%. just put, put just putting the, doing that kind of a traditional approach that way? Yeah, I was all so as a side hustle, right? And I always have a side hustle always have a side hustle. So when I was in corporate, my side hustle was real estate. When I exited corporate and started to build an online uh, content business, that was my primary focus. And actually real estate was still my side hustle. I always had envisioned that real estate would be my primary focus, uh, exiting corporate. And then maybe, maybe YouTube would be a side hustle. Uh, but actually, YouTube and online presence had, had gone into the primary spot just from an opportunity standpoint. Yeah. Um, and then with that W-2 income, my main strategy was amazing assets, $250,000 or more per asset. And then that asset was against fixed interest. So it was even back in 2010, I'm like, oh man, inflation, inflation's really going to kick up, you know, pretty soon we're printing so much money, these kind of, <laughs> these kind of things. So I was like, I'm going to lock in, you know, these fixed interests. I, I started off in a classic FHA on a duplex with three and a half percent down to get my foot in the door, right? And to get rolling with that. Uh, but then as I acquired, and now my active portfolio is five properties, nine doors. That's my active portfolio. Um, and then those have fixed financing against them. Uh, equity pay down over time. And now, now we're really seeing and have in the last few years rents go up and, and now that arbitrage, right? So, so let's say inflation seven or 8% and I'm fixed at like 3.75, four or, or lower. 
So now the arbitrage is really starting to gain steam. Um, even though, because I was buying B or B plus class properties, my cash flow wasn't amazing. You know, I know you've ran through the numbers on these things in the past. So I was getting the one percent rule. I was usually about a one point one five to one point three five on on these B plus properties. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, you know, I always say the first one to five years. You know, if you're doing residential, there's no there's no cash flow. You're reinvesting. You're putting that roof on that the last owner did not put on. You're swapping out that furnace. You're you're doing equity pay down and maybe some appreciation, but that's not. I don't really look at appreciation as as a, a strategy for me. Yeah. Five to ten years, you're starting to get going, and then ten years plus. Okay, now maybe you can pull a line of credit to get some working capital. Maybe you want to start doing some some rehabs, and if you can if you can do it small but mighty for a couple decades or three decades, that's when we're you know all high five and and uh, and have a little bit more flexibility with lifestyle, or if you want a vacation home or whatever your goals are, you yep. know that that's easily obtainable. Hundred percent. Yeah. Th- this is a this is a slow game, and I think I think that kind of detracts some people from getting into real estate investing because yeah. I always tell people it's like uh, you're planting a seed on this fruit tree. And if, if you expect a fruit tree to grow into a, a mature fruit tree that's producing fruit in two years, you know, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to you're going to try to take shortcuts. So you, you described yeah. it perfectly. And, you're, and so your story, just to give people context, you're in the, mid, uh, the Midwest, right, in the Illinois area where your yeah. properties are. So you're investing locally. You're direct, investing directly. So you own these properties directly. You're getting your hands dirty. You're ma- self-managing. You're even doing maintenance and those kind of things on the properties yourself. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the types of properties you own or the strategies you use on these certain properties. You start off with house hacking, the duplex. But you know, from what I know of you, you now, you also have kind of a mix of short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, long-term rentals. Can you talk about sort of how that's evolved and why you choose to, to rent properties in certain ways? Yeah, so uh, traditionally I just have done long-term rentals, you know, 12, the standard 12-month leases. I'm in a, a Big Ten college market. I'm in Champaign, Illinois. So we have a transient population, right? We have kind of the, the school calendar, which I know you're familiar with. Um, so really I was targeting mostly to that type of property and trying to get kind of student rentals. That, that was something that I was looking at. I've got a bit of a mix now, um, but it was just standard rentals. And th- to be honest, like 30 year fixed interest financing was one of like the top uh, strategies for me. I just knew over time, the thought that uh, uh, I was able to get financing against a business at 30% fixed interest below like 5% to me was kind of like, man, that's just like a no brainer. It is incredible. Um, against assets, right? Against like tangible assets, not not against like starting a, a, a restaurant or something like that and, and nothing against restaurant owners. I just appreciate how hard that is, but like tangible assets, that's, that is a need for everyone to have housing, right? So I just did that for years and years. I did that for about 11 or 12 years. And now short-term rental, mid-term rental is all the craze. And, and I do think there's an opportunity there. I don't do vacation markets, right? I'm not really going all in on that. I have looked at some of those projects, but I don't like, a, I don't like only the plan A. I like plan A, plan B, plan C. So yeah. plan A, if I want to hustle, if a new investor wants to hustle, crank up some cash flow, do short-term rental, do mid-term rental. Um, that is what, you know, 75% or 80% of the new investors are doing, right? They're they're hustling and they're cranking cash flow, which I think is super smart. And it can kind of that can actually that could tangibly accelerate your growth in yeah. real estate through cranking that cash flow. Because at the start it's very slow, right? You drain your you drain that savings account and you slowly build it back up from your W2 and then you get that next one. And that's what I was doing. Only really buying one every two or three years. So now I'm just saying, can I can I build an entity that can sustain itself where I'm at least one level removed? Because in the past, and, and you had mentioned this, super involved. I'm I'm managing, I'm I'm fixing it, you know, I'm kind of wearing a lot of different hats. Not all the hats, but but a lot of those. First first line of defense. Um, but now I'm I'm converting those nine doors that I have here with a target of 10 doors over this next 12 months. 
all into predominantly midterm rentals. Okay, so I'm in a transient market. So I have a lot of traveling scholars, some people doing construction projects within the university. Um, the traveling nurses is a classic one. Um, so going after that at least one month rental up to five or six months rental. Yeah. Um, and then a few three bedrooms or things that aren't quite as um, attractive as a midterm do those as short term, try to get those football weekends, try to get mom's weekend, graduation weekend, all these these very high ticket prices where you're a very attractive product uh, compared to a hotel room. Yeah, I really like this idea that you're explaining that you you have a portfolio of properties and there's sort of like this optimization, almost like you're tuning up the engine, you know, on a, on a machine. You're like, OK, these properties are probably a little bit better for short term because they have, they're bigger, they have better, bigger bedrooms. Their location maybe is right next to an amenity. Let's let's put those in the short term rental category. And then you have these other ones that maybe because you're in a transient town near, near a hospital, near a university, near construction that makes fits this midterm rental. And then, you know, long term rentals, which is pr my predominant strategy. And a lot of it's a little bit of laziness <laughs> in my case. You know, I just all right. The student rentals it. work. The student rentals work. It's not don't, don't break it. Uh, it's nice yeah. knowing you could kind of optimize that. And it also has to do with regulations. Short term rentals have been kind of regulated out. Uh, in my in my little market at Clemson, just through right. so so I, I could try the midterm rental though because that's a little different. It would it would fit the category. So I, I think that's a really good point for everybody to pay attention to. Number one, if you're a new investor, you have the need for cash flow. Every dollar you can save in the first three to five years is just critical because you just got to recycle right. that money. And then, but also thinking about your time and what you can what you're willing to do. What you're if, if you're willing to, to have a side hustle, which we agree everyone should have. You can make mm -hmm. it a short-term rental. You know that's that's a, that's the side hustle managing that. So you're you're sort of mixing those up. And I'm curious. Let, let's talk about midterm rentals specifically because you've kind of zoned in on that. You had experience yeah. managing properties yourself. Sort of the mm -hmm. allure of midterm rentals is similar management hassle to a long-term rental. Maybe less management hassle than a short-term rental, but more income than a long-term rental. Have you have you how, how have you found that to be kind of in the on the results side when you've done your own midterm rentals? Uh, yeah, so I agree. Um, short term rental, I think it should be super clear that is a hospitality play. Um, I mean, clean cleaners and just going above and beyond surprise and delight, you know, for your guests, you're you're in hospitality, and it is absolutely intensive. Um, if you have that sort of personality, where like having something to do every day or getting a call in the middle of the day and having to kind of do something that wasn't planned, that's not going to completely throw you off course. You know, you can really crank some cash flow if you are strategically placed with short terms. Midterms much closer to to long term rentals. What I love is you have the best, some of the best billboards. Uh, that we've ever had. And those billboards are Airbnb, Furnish Finder, VRBO, Bookings.com, you know, or or all of them, whichever ones you want to take, you know, they are taking a percentage, obviously, but a lot of those platforms are also pivoting to midterms, pivoting to long, even long terms. Yeah. So being in that and exercising a, even a few of your units in those spaces, if a new opportunity does come up where Airbnb or Furnish Finder or whomever comes to now do 12 months, you already have some momentum and you start rolling. One thing I really like about midterms is I get in the properties enough where it like forces me to be good on my maintenance. Um, it, you, I need a nice product, right? It has to be in really good shape and I'm in there, you know, every month or every two months. Uh, so I can take that as an opportunity to make sure I'm changing out the, the furnace filter to make sure, you know, I'm checking the screws on the door hinge and the latches and deadbolts so they're not misaligned and just all those things that kind of slowly start to creep in a long term rental. Uh, when you get in there and you see, you know, water in the vanity base and the doors aren't closing and the furnace filter is like completely blocked. <laughs> Kind of the standard stuff of a of a long term rental. I think midterm helps force that hand a little bit. Um, and the beautiful thing about that, so your plan B, if you're going to go back to normal rentals, you kind of have a, a beautiful property. So you can really be at top of the market rents uh, just from the look, feel, and maintenance of your property. And then plan C, if you do need to liquidate and you do need to sell, uh, you already have the pictures you know, you're, you're like ready to go. You can list it within like two days because you're just ready to roll. And 
at least in my market, I would be the best duplex that has ever been listed on the MLS, you know, because it's usually 15 years of deferred maintenance and, and they're like, they're just tossing it on the MLS and the, you know, the gutters are falling off and they have, if I could get a duplex or triplex with more than like four photos of the interior, <laughs> that would be amazing, yeah. you know? And so I would have professional photos and, yeah. So plan C, um, although it's probably a little bit hard to justify the cost that I did with furnishing, the cost I did with CapEx to improve some of these properties, uh, if I need to liquidate, I would have the you know the best chance of that for sure. Yeah, I love those points. You, you, the typical duplex you see on the MLS, and this is to your advantage as a buyer, is that you know the four pictures and it's it's got a lot of deferred maintenance. But this is a the midterm rental, in addition to being a lower hassle higher cash flow play is also a long-term maintenance play. That's kind of counterintuitive. You think, okay, people are moving in and out, but you're actually getting, you or your manager are getting in there mm-hmm. more often. And some of my worst maintenance problems I've had on my properties were not necessarily like active negligence where you're like, I'm just gonna ignore this problem. It was more, I didn't know about that. Like how, how come I didn't know about this water slowly leaking out of the ba- base of the toilet that then rotted out the entire floor mm-hmm. and the sill for 15 feet all around it, you know, like that's, I would love to know about that. I would have loved to know about that, but the tenant obviously didn't care about walking through water to the bathroom every every time. So, you know, th- those things oh, I happen. Love those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Several thousand dollars worth of damage. So maybe maybe yeah. that's a, that's a good segue. Oh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on one, I would, one more question about your midterm rentals. Then I want to go into some maintenance yeah. questions. Um, so one of the, the 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 thing that sells a lot of people on that is higher income, and I'm wondering if you have an example, maybe with a specific property where you could show us before and after. Like, all right, here's what I was getting rent on a long term rental. Here's what I got on midterm rental, just to show some of the, the the benefit there from a cash flow standpoint. Yeah, so I have within two blocks of the university, so it's a great location, and and has always been a great location. So the property was listed for eight fifty as a twelve month. Uh, rental, so not a nine month rental, a 12 month rental in our markets. So it's 850 per month for a two bedroom, one bath. That's traditionally what it rented for. Uh, was not done up very well. Uh, it was a, you know, it was reasonable condition, uh, but nothing too spectacular. So I turned that one into midterm rental and I did not do actually on that one, I did not do a full rehab. I am, as we speak, doing a full rehab on that, but I did not originally. I just put on Airbnb, I took the photos, I had to do a little bit more furnishing, right? I needed to get silverware and plates in there and stock it with like paper towels and toilet paper. Um, So I needed to spend a little bit of money, but that quickly uh, filled, it had no problem filling up. It was a one week minimum is way I was doing it, but I would average one month. And even my last one was a five month rental. I actually had students starting to use midterm rentals as student housing, which I think something to, to pay attention to, you know, the, the get everything now on demand, uh, flexibility type of um, trends that we're seeing. I think there's something there with student rentals. You know, we, we are across two different cities, Champaign, Urbana. So maybe for the fall semester, you try out Urbana, ah, that's not really my cup of tea. Okay, when I come back from winter break with my two suitcases, I'm going to go to the other town, right? So the flexibility, I think there's something there with student rentals. So it's something to pay attention to that midterm Airbnb, whatever that is, or maybe a new student rental platform will serve that flexibility where it's bring two suitcases, bring your stuff. Don't worry about going to the grocery store or Target or whatever for that first weekend where you're getting, you know, your all your different plates and all your different things that you need. Uh, but it's ready to go. So I really think there's there's something there. But when I went midterm, uh, to go back to your question, it it would go about $2,000 or $2,200 per month. Now, we need to back out internet and back out utilities, you know, and, and back out a little bit more in maintenance and some and, and eventually some cleaning when they move out. But it's safe to say that it was two, two X in that market, in that college market, two bedroom, um, it was about two X. So you need to get to know your market. Uh, in my market, one one bedrooms and two bedrooms are fantastic for midterm rentals. Great. 
Yeah, that's super helpful. I'm actually taking notes on some of my properties, and I, I think that's an interesting trend to think about. If the if the entire society, both adults and students, are going to mo- more mobile, more flexible, they're paying for flexibility, Airbnb culture, yeah. that makes a ton of sense. And so, yeah, I've seen one and a half to two times the rent be kind of a, a good target for a lot of people on the midterm rentals as well. So that's that's the that's the appeal, right? There's and and you got to figure out which properties make sense. Midterm rentals, yeah. I mean. I would have been all over that starting off. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, you could even short term rent. Like I, I had a roommate. You know, I had the classic house hack, right? I had a roommate paying me. Yep. Had the other side of the duplex paying me, um, and I was all about hustling. So I would, I would personally be all over midterm rentals. Yeah, for sure. Great. Well, that's definitely something we'll keep talking about here on the podcast. It's a, it's a growing trend and. Um, I, I want to go back to the properties themselves. So the, this is one of those under talked about topics of the property itself, the maintenance, how that keeps up. And my own experience, I'd be curious for you too, Scott, the, the winners and the losers out of my rental properties have really come down to, if you assume everything's the same location wise, the winners and the losers have really come down to how maintenance, low maintenance versus high maintenance the properties are. Like the ones that are just have tons and tons of cost on the maintenance side, are not my winners from a, from an investment standpoint. The ones that are built like tanks and are really resilient and are more efficient have been my winners. So this topic of maintenance is, is incredibly important. And I think you have an interesting perspective because you've been an engineer, you put things together from that standpoint, and you've also been doing the maintenance yourself. And you even started a, a YouTube channel. And I'm, I'm curious just for the backstory of that, because you're now known for every, for doing property maintenance on YouTube. Like people come and check yeah. you out and find your stuff. Like how did, how did that even get started? Because you're doing your rental properties, you're doing all that. Did you just like go in there with your cell phone and say, let me just try this one day and, and put yeah. this on YouTube? Like I'm just curious the backstory of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so first let's talk a little bit about like maintenance, winners and losers, you know, what type of properties. Um, all of us pretty much going in basically don't even take that into consideration. There's some attractiveness of like a new property or something like that, or maybe you can leverage an FHA loan and get an amazing triplex and live on one unit. I think some of us do think through that. Um, But yes, so I have a 1904 built what's called a four square, you know, so it's like two stories with an attic and had four bedrooms upstairs that split into a duplex. You know, that thing's been a bear because plumbing's all over the place. And this is even after I did a massive rehab. You know, I hauled out personally five 20 yard dumpsters of plaster and (laughs) all this. Yeah, I I would not do that again. But I spent a lot of quality time. So I spent a lot of quality time with that property. I knew that property top to bottom. I made all the decisions on it. We re plumbed the whole property, did quite a bit of electrical work. And even with all that, that property has been, uh, in terms of maintenance, has been my highest uh, percentage maintenance, where that property might be at the six to 8%, a little bit more uh, what you would expect. And that's even with me doing some of the work. And my other properties are more like, you know, three to 4% or even 2% with me. I am the front line of defense. So when somebody complains about, um, the furnace acting up, there's a water leak in the basement. I can't get the deadbolt to lock. I'm the first line of defense. I go out there and usually take care of most of those. So I'm able to save quite a bit of maintenance. Um, what I love now in my market, and, and you kind of alluded to this, I love um, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s kind of dated properties, uh, ranches where I have attic access and crawl spaces. I actually don't like basements uh, on rentals. Uh, basements are just, in my market, we're really flat. So the water table's high. So getting water in the basement is a real thing. So if you have sump pumps to get that out, well, I mean, sump pumps are are, are going to fail. Yep. And one thing to really keep in mind too, if you have a bathroom in the basement, that sounds awesome. Oh my God, I have more bathrooms. This is, you know, finished square footage. I can really sell that. Be careful. So those are called trash pumps. Trash pumps will take the you know, the water coming out of your shower or the toilet water into a pit, and then it pumps out all that good stuff uh, into the sewer system. Those are terrible. I hate those in rental properties. I say that because I've had to fix two sewage backups uh, in the same property within two years, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Because you can imagine you can't get sewer backup on drywall and not 
cut that out and get mm. all the, you know, remediate yep. it. And Serve Pro will be happy to do that for you for, you know, five to $10,000, but they leave with exposed studs, bare concrete, right? And then you got to call in your, your contractor to, to build it back up. So I'd just be very, very cautious with basement bathrooms, basements in general. Um, and I love ranches with attic access. So if you ever need to add anything or fix anything and crawl space access, same thing. If you need to access the plumbing, access the uh, HVAC ductwork, access the electrical, it's very easy to do. I love those. You could spruce them up. You can do a lipstick rehab. You can paint some cabinets, paint the walls. Maybe they have wood floor or great flooring already. Um, I just think bang for the buck. Those are easy to uh, change the appearance to get highest and best use. And also they prove out to usually be the best in terms of overall maintenance. Yeah, I, I love it. I would add, let's, let's go back and forth on this because let's, let's talk about our ideal rental property and kind of pick this apart from a maintenance standpoint. So I, I would 100% agree. For me, a ranch style, basically basically a rectangle box. You know, like if, if I had a one story rectangle that was about 1500 square feet, three bedroom, two bath in the case of like a single family house, maybe a little smaller for apartments. And then I had a crawl space, I had an attic. I would add to that my ex, the, the surfaces of the property. I, I spent a ton of time on wooden properties, painting them in between and, and having to go oh, back. And, and so a, a brick property on the exterior or some kind of masonry and then having uh, non-wood surfaces on the windows, trim, you know, the fascia, fascia boards. Like if I had metal, I had maybe some vinyl trim, uh, windows that were metal or vinyl. You know, basically, you got everything on the outside of the property is, is super low maintenance. And then you add to the fact that you said, like paying attention to where the water goes. Like if, if you have a property where the, the house is sitting on a low lot, you know, the streets up here, the, the yeah. house is down here, you got to pay attention, attention to where the water goes. And all of these are bad experiences that I've had to pay for out of, out of my, out of the checkbook where, oh, wait a yeah. minute. Yeah, I could get a, um, a French drain system or I could get a, you know, a sump pump. And that sounds, that sounds like a solution, but the ideal rental property would not have all those mechanical systems oh. that have to break and have to move because even if they work, you have to pay attention to them. And I've had dehumidifiers in a property that failed and then the whole property got moldy and within 30 days. And now I have to do mold remediation and fix that. So I'm 100% mm -hmm. ag agreeing with you. And maybe are there any other things you can think of that you would add to your ideal rental property that would, from, a, from a maintenance standpoint? Um, no, I'm completely aligned with you, Brick. I love Brick, man. You know, maybe it doesn't look like the most modern or you didn't paint it white, which pretty much everybody does with Brick these days, it seems like on rehabs. But man, it just, it's bulletproof. Maybe you have to do what's called tuck pointing where you're, you know, you're kind of resecuring and waterproofing that masonry. Um, I'm okay with old, uh, older wood windows. Some of the, like the old Anderson, like casement windows and stuff. Yeah, you're going to need to paint them on the outside, but those things, I swear those things last longer than the, you know, vinyl replacements where the springs are going out and like they're warping from heat and stuff. So I'm okay with having to basically the trim work, you know, having to paint that or something, but I do not like wood houses. No way. Not for, not for rentals. Um, if you get a smoking deal, you know, it's a smoking deal. You can, you can put up with some, or maybe you can justify getting some vinyl on there. Yeah. Um, and then, yes, the whole premise of one of my unfair advantages wasn't that I wanted to do all the maintenance work. I don't want to do all the painting. I don't want to do all the flooring. I really hire out any of that high volume stuff, right? So I'll really be the first line of defense. But if I need to read, you know, put new windows in the property, I'm not doing that. I, I That's way too many hours committed. And, and I do value my time, you know, higher than that. Um, so I will not, I will not do that, but I need a, an appreciation and understanding of maintenance. So when I do have that wet backyard and the professional comes in, he says, yeah, well, let's put, you know, 30 foot of French drain, you know, it's going to be perforated corrugated pipe. It's going to seep in that water. It's going to take that water over to a pit. And then we're going to put an exterior sub pump. And then we're going to put 50 lines of PVC. It's like, okay. Yeah. That's one way to fix it. But whoa, the complexity, complexity of your property just went up exponential, you know, like, so now you have exterior pumps that need electrical and can go out. And yeah, so the experts, you know, 
mean well, but <laughs> but they're not going to have to do the maintenance, right, for, yeah. for 7, 10, 15, 20 years. So having an appreciation and a little bit of understanding of, uh, of maintenance of what's possible, not that you have to do that, but you're just going to be a better consumer to work with those professionals and kind of push back a little bit because, yeah, there's been some really bad ideas uh, given to me by professionals. Um, and it's one way to fix the problem, but one, it's probably a little higher cost initially and maintenance isn't even a consideration. Yeah. It seems like a different mindset too, Scott. Like I think you, you being someone who's been in there and you know how to do it. And even if you don't do it yourself, you can analyze, you can sort of analyze the cost benefit analysis. I, yeah. I found that the mistakes I made early in my career, knowing nothing about maintenance, knowing nothing about properties was not thinking long-term enough. I was, I was thinking very, very short term. Often it was just because I'm a new investor. I don't have much cash. I'm just trying to, all right, let me just put that faucet in because that's the one that's cheapest at Lowe's, right? Let me just do that. But if, if you have as a long-term investor, and this goes back to the whole strategy, like if, you are, if you're deciding to own a property for the next 15, 20 years, perhaps, maybe longer, then you, you think very different about that faucet, that French drain, that exterior yeah. siding. You know, it, it's, it's not just today's money. This is money that you're going to have to spend 15, 20 years from now. And therefore, you, you make a, a little bit a little bit different financial calculus on, on yep. maintenance and everything else. Yeah, let's give it's probably super granular, but always go with Delta, Delta or maybe Moen. Just lock Good. it in, <laughs> not buy Tuscany from Menards or whatever you want to <laughs> buy. It's literally like twenty dollars cheaper, but you'll never be able to get a valve for whatever reason. The brush nickel or chrome finish like deteriorates in three years it leaks way more delta is serviceable at all your major home improvement stores all the professionals appreciate it they'll be able to swap out a valve opposed to an entire fixture mm. so just go with delta and if you do that consistently then you know you have delta fixtures right then you start to really lock in on these things that oh i actually know what that vanity faucet is or kitchen faucet or shower mixing valve. That's an R R10,000, the standard one from Delta. That's what I use in all my properties. I know that sounds pretty granular, but if you're in this for the long haul, like some of those things are just lock in on it. Don't don't save the $20 up front, like lock in so you're you have a some strategy long term. I love granular, by the way. So let, let's keep going with that, actually. Um, <laughs> this, this theme of your ideal rental property, we've talked about faucets, we've talked about exterior siding, we've talked about other things. Are there any other things, Scott, like maybe even moving inside the property that are things that you you do in your particular rental properties with the mindset of trying to save money long run on maintenance or make them easier for you to maintain? Yeah, I guess let's say exterior first. So let's... Um let's give some love to the downspouts of these worlds. Uh, <laughs> never give any love. Um, so having a downspout that goes into a PVC pipe or corrugated pipe that then specifically delivers that water away from your foundation and on a downhill slope, right? It gets the water going downhill and away from your uh, property. Now that is that is easier said than done on some properties, but specifically I'm sitting in a basement of my my house and this one was a classic case. All the downspouts were like just dumping at the base and my sump pump would run every minute and a half to two minutes all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking all the time. So what happened? Even in my own house, I had a water backup right. and I had a little bit of damage to my carpet in the basement. So, that was in uh, where I started to plan out, okay, how do I extend this downspout and some pump discharge 25 feet away from the house? Okay, how do I do that on the front side? So spending some money on your downspouts and really making those solid. The problem is the a lot of people will just take a piece of uh, downspout, put two sheet metal screws through it, make it so it pivots up and down so the, so the person mowing your lawn could could put those up. Usually they just like hit them. <laughs> they just hit them and they break off. They sit yes. in the yard. Yep. Um, but kind of make it, you know, sp if you're going to spend a little time, man, there's some, there's some value there. And on everyday home repairs, search downspouts, I give you multiple different uh, levels. 
that you can go through. I show you how to install a dry well if you have a flat yard. You know, like there's many, many things because these are all things I have to do for my house. So now just doing that, my sump pump runs like a couple times a day. I mean, it's a dramatic difference. So it, it is something you need to pay attention to, especially if you get that rental property with a basement where you really need to think things out. So downspouts, I'm, I think, are, are something we need to pay attention to. All those little things that start falling off, so the towel rack, the cabinet hardware, for whatever reason, all ceiling fans turning to, turn into drooping flowers, um, like all these things, uh, if a, if a tenant could tighten a Phillips head screw on a ceiling fan, <laughs> like you want to go in and all your blades are like at an angle, um, you can just do one quick round of tightening all those things up, the set screw on your towel rack, your ceiling fans, the screw in your cabinet hardware, the machine screws on your doorknob. But when you tighten those up, just use um, Loctite thread locker, the blue thread locker, not the red. Red is like permanent. You might never get that screw off. The blue just lets it, it just is less likely to back out and loosen up. So you do that kind of one big round and put one little drop of thread locker on all those things and everything will stay tight and you won't have things falling off and then in turn over, you're trying to fix these different things. So good. Yeah. I mean, who would have known we would have given so much love to the, the, the types of screws and thread lockers you're using and the down, but the downspouts and thread locks of these world need, need more love. I, I think the, we, we, rent, we rental investors need to pay attention to this. So that, that's really, how you stand out too, right? Because yeah. like a normal rental property, you know, even when the new tenants getting in, half those things are probably hanging out there. And I have a, I have a picture. I was out for a morning walk. And there was like one of those uh, classic accordion plastic downspout extensions, which oh, I yeah. don't love oh, those. So cheap, so cheap. <laughs> it was so cheap. <laughs> but it was coming off the downspout, and then the guy had it shooting into the window well of his basement. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so everything from his roof was going down the downspout through this accordion, and then in the window well of his basement. I was like, <laughs> so yeah, so you think these things would never be done, but that's why if we set it up in a permanent nature, bite that bullet, you know, five years down the road when you have the cash flow, kind of bite that bullet and it just it future proofs, you know, our properties. And especially if you're holding it long term, will you get paid off for that if you sell it next year? Absolutely not. Right. But if you're if you're holding it long term, it will. That those things actually will add up over time. Yeah, and I've also just the, the general attitude of, of being a, a pro maintenance person, somebody who fixes your property, takes pride in it. My, my father is a, a real estate investor as well, a rental property person who's always kind of gone, gone above and beyond on the maintenance. And it's actually cost them in the short run. Like if he were to compare with a buddy who had rental properties who was a slumlord, <laughs> you know, that yeah. person, would, oh, look all the cash flow I'm making. And they would seem to be more successful in the short run. But there's a couple reasons to do to take what Scott's talking about in the very specific thing and do it on a wider basis is that number one, your, your, your job, the value you deliver to your tenant, why we get paid, why we build wealth in this world is that we give somebody a good place to live. Like we, we are taking care of this property and giving them a good place to live and we're reducing the maintenance so it's easier to do that over the long run. And then also I found when you, when you go to sell your property, <clears throat> maybe they don't look at how tight the screws are, maybe they don't look at all that stuff, but if you take that general attitude and you extrapolate it over time, you're gonna to tend to have properties that are more well-kept, that don't break down as easily, that you and I can tell, an experienced real estate investor, we show up at property A, property B, we can tell the person who didn't care at all about maintenance, oh, yeah. we can tell the person who was super into maintenance and they got a checklist and like, here's the thing I do every time the property turns over, I tighten these screws, I do this painting. And that's I do just this, a you know. signal, right? Because you're not yeah. gonna see everything. So if you know the things that you're picking up are maintained, um, all those other things, right? Yeah. So the drain going out to the street that has roots in it right now, that's going to be a massive bill for you. Just you need to pay attention to those things because you could absolutely get bit within your first year to three with some pretty big CapEx expenses where you're not going to shortcut. And you need to understand yourself also because some of these things are very small, but if you're the type of personality that if you get these small maintenance calls, it really takes energy away from you. You don't want to buy that next rental property. 
be conscious of that. Spend a little bit more money on your properties so you feel good about them. Yep. So you're not getting the smaller maintenance calls. And then you buy the next rental property and then that translates into much more growth. Um, personally, I don't, I don't like to shortcut. It takes energy away from me when I know all of my properties are hanging on by a string. Some investors, that doesn't bother them. It bothers me. So I would not buy more properties if they're all in that condition. No, 100%. So, so I got a question, Scott. I mean, some of these, there, there's so many details we could talk about with maintenance, and I, I, I would love to do that. I think it's, it's really helpful. But I, I'm, mm -hmm. if somebody's listening to this, they're a relatively new investor, and they're they're like, all right, maintenance, property upkeep, understanding my property is, is a gap. I like, I need to learn more about this. I, I want to ask about how you learn that, and part of that's going to be watching your YouTube channel. So I'm going to put a link to that I and am. and just going. But how how do you suggest to somebody who's sort of green in the area of understanding how construction and maintenance, how properties put together? Like, how do you get your head around it to the point where you can have this kind of conversation like we're having, and you kind of understand how it all fits together? Yeah. Um and it also depends on what you're doing, right? So if you're doing midterm or short term, you you do need to have this stuff on lockdown because it's going to start translating to star reviews and how you rank on those platforms. Yep. So I have a one pager. We can put the link in the description. It's a one page maintenance checklist. It's more for your primary residence. So it gives you your monthly activities, your yearly activities, and then seasonal activities. It's a little bit more from the you know viewpoint of a four seasons type of environment. I'm in Illinois, right? So Southwest, you might need a tweak, but you can use that as a baseline for your rental properties. Like, what should I be doing? Just go down the list. And if you've never touched any of these things, yeah. it might be worth right taking a look at that. And then also you can tailor it to your properties. Maybe you have a rural property with well or septic system, right? We need to add some things in there. Maybe you're in a market that has a stucco or some different exterior options that I'm not used to. Maybe there's some maintenance there. You know, we have gutters here. Some people don't really use gutters as much, maybe out in the Southwest. So you can just add to that, that one page maintenance checklist. And that will give you some guidelines and let you know pretty quickly, like gutter cleaning. Uh, How do you do that? We have a ton <laughs> of leaves on our property or needles from the, the pine trees. I never thought once about that gutter cleaning. Well, go drive by your property and you'll see a little botanical garden growing out of your, <laughs> your gutters from all the, uh, the seeds that planted there, you know, and they got everything they need to germinate. So it's something to, to think through. Uh, it's not the end of the world, but again, if that's something that bothers you, you take a hold of it, you know, take a hold of it, be more proactive, spend a little more money. Your maintenance cost is going to go up, but that will empower you to do that next deal and to be motivated. And I always look at things as a source or sink of energy. Is this a source of energy that makes me want to do more and be more in that day? Or is this a sink of energy? It takes energy away from me and it limits what I can do in my daily life. So if you're if you know something is in your life as a sink of energy and you have the option to eliminate that, eliminate it because it's going to it's going to be a multiplier for you long term. Yeah, well said. And I just want to encourage everybody, you know, maintenance can be one of those things that seems intimidating and repairs in general as a newer person to properties. But it doesn't have to be like I feel like we're in the golden age of being a property owner, whether it's your own home or a rental property, because you can watch somebody like Scott online show you how to install an outlet, show you how to build a deck. I mean, this is like, this, yeah. this is, even if you don't do it yourself, I find myself all the time when I have a repair, I'm here in Spain right now, some, the, mm -hmm. my, my, con my property manager calls me, it's a weird repair I haven't seen before. Um, they've got two bids for me from contractors and I'm like, oh, that seems a little high for me. Like I didn't realize it's that high. I'll go watch a YouTube video on how to do that. And then I'll understand, all right, that's, that seems like a one day job. That seems like a half day job. Extract, so, so the more you learn about this, I want to encourage everybody to make this a, something you study. Because we, we study how to run the numbers on properties. We study how to, you know, paperwork and leases and things like that. But I don't think maintenance is something that we deliberately focus on enough. And yet it's such a critical piece. And I hope, I hope this conversation with Scott has been, has showed you just the tip of the iceberg of how important that could be. And I would actually love to hear from all of you. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on the podcast, reach out to me specifically. If this is a topic you'd like to have covered more. Um, 
I don't know if I could twist Scott's arm a little bit to have follow-up conversations on some uh, specific topics related to real estate investing, um, maintenance, but let me know by sending an email to podcast at coachcarson.com or leaving a, a comment on YouTube. Let me know if this is a topic that you'd like to have more education specifically of, and I'd love to do that perhaps on the channel, on the YouTube channel, and we could go into some different different education that would help you as a rental property owner. Um, so that's a long, long-winded answer to say, Scott, like I really, I really appreciate this conversation and I, I want to, I want to wrap it up going back to some of your real estate investing story, kind of going, taking a segue from the maintenance part. Uh, a lot of people listening to this are at various stages of early stages of their real estate investing career. Maybe they had bought the first property, maybe they're buying those first two. And just from a financial independence standpoint, trying to go for that goal of financial independence, is there anything that comes to mind for you to, that you would give as an advice to them early in their real estate investing journey that might help them stay encouraged, stay focused on, on that long-term goals while they're in the trenches, sort of getting started and getting, getting this thing going? Yeah, um, kind of tied to the side hustle or even your corporate career. Um, I would not pull the ripcord too early. So if you build up your rental portfolio, which it's really it's it's paying for your monthly, you know, expenses, and you're like, um, I got to get out of here. I'm out of here. Well, I mean, don't forget, you're losing your W two. So if you have any more thirty year fixed interest loans that you can get against quality uh, properties, you got a while before you're going to get those again. Um, and then two, don't forget, where's the money for that next property coming from? Um, so I was not in a position to exit from my rental income, my corporate career. It, it was this other business. So what I'm trying to do right now is set up three different cash flow streams I can pay individually. One could pay for my monthly expenses. So my active portfolio of 10 midterm rentals could pay for my monthly expenses. If those go away, my passive investments, where I'm just a capital partner in much larger deals, finding great people around the country that need a little more capital to go to the next level, that can pay for my monthly expenses. And then my online business can pay for my monthly expenses and multiples thereafter. And why I do that is because I want to keep injecting cash into assets, right? And if I only have one of those that's that my portfolio is coming to work and pay for my monthly expenses and I'm leaving my corporate job and that's all I got, one, you're you're fairly fragile, right? So we want to be anti-fragile. We want to have that robustness and be able to take advantage, especially now when things are transitioning, take advantage of that. So I wouldn't yeah. jump out too early uh, from corporate career. I'd really build up a kind of a multiple of what is needed. Don't let that lifestyle drift too early, right? A multiple of what's needed because you're gonna wanna continue to crank. You're gonna have more hours to put into it, but you're going to need capital uh, to deploy that unless you have investors or, or you have a different strategy. Yeah, we've kind of gone full circle back to your Robert Kiyosaki comments earlier that this is a, this is a cash flow quadrant that if you ever wanna leave having to trade hours for dollars, You've got to be yeah. able to invest that money into assets. And I, I really, you and I have had these conversations offline, but I really appreciate your approach of having this one portfolio of direct investments that you control. And I have a small and mighty portfolio that you can handle relatively yep. yourself. You've got a more passive side of your investing business in your case. And also mine is investing with other people being the limited yep. partner. Some people do that. You know, I also have stock index investing as well. That kind of fits into that category Absolutely. for me. And then you have this online business, which I, I do, I asked you a little bit earlier, but I wanted to, I told you I would come back to this. Um, a lot of people might be curious and I'm curious too, as somebody who has a YouTube channel, who's an online creator, I really love the online creator world and the, the, the world of educating other people and using the scale of online media to, to kind of, to help other people. How did that, how did that start for you? I think that was a really interesting point because you've now gotten to the point yeah. where hundreds, millions of people are watching you uh, learn about a repair. So I just, was, was that something intentional or did that, it's kind of an accident? Yeah, it's so crazy. I like, I, I giggle here, like that that's even possible that, that millions of people can watch you, you know, secure a toilet paper holder on drywall. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, that is the thing. Um, it literally started in my first house hack duplex. So I went up there, uh, literally the toilet paper holder was classically coming off the wall, a drywall anchor had worked loose, right? And the bracket wasn't holding. Uh, so I 
got my iPhone out. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. My audio was terrible. My lighting was terrible. Um, I wasn't even really super knowledgeable uh, on these things. And I just started documenting that. And whenever I try something new, I try not to, I try not to quit too early, right? So I set myself a goal of 10 videos or 20 videos or 30 videos or 50 videos. Um, and that's same with real estate too, because you, too many people start things and they don't give it enough of a chance to be successful. So I initially started 10 video goal. So I was just documenting, swapping out a can light to an LED retrofit and, and documenting how to, to fix a, a water leak on an outdoor spigot. You know, these are all at my house or at my rental properties. Um, and then I went to from 11 to 20 and then I went to 30 and then I gave it a little bit of a break and things started to organically grow and mature. And, um, and now that's my full-time focus. Now I see the opportunity. Um, it is a massive opportunity. And I guess for a lot of people, it's, um, it's confusing, right? Like how like YouTube videos, like, do you make $10? You know, like yeah, yeah. I see people now and they're like, uh, you know, Hey, what are you up to? I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing YouTube. And they're like, Oh, Hey, are you okay? Do you want to like talk about it? <laughs> like, what do you, how do you put food on the table? Um, but if you step back and you think, well, you have a business with which you're leading with value. You're helping people save time and money and possibly like hundreds of dollars and days or hours, right? By mm. helping educate them, helping them take control of their own repairs. Um, and in return, they're actually not paying you anything directly. Usually maybe there's some ad revenue, like a, a penny or, or some fraction of a penny coming from that. Or maybe they buy wire strippers from your Amazon link and you get some percentage kickback through an affiliate. Um, well, if you do that at scale, you know, if you do that a million views a month, 4 million views a month or more, I mean, these things add up. So that is my focus now is how do I continue to build a portfolio uh, of evergreen videos? Changing out a Delta faucet is pretty relevant next month and next year. And I look at those, these little guys are little rental properties. These little guys are doors for me. and. I have, you know, 50 or a hundred videos where the individual video pays me more monthly than, than a rental property door. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can see where that power comes in because those don't have toilets. Those don't have tenants. Those don't have much of any kind of maintenance. Um, so when you are able to see some of these opportunities and it dovetails into something you're already doing, I'm already doing rental investing. I'm already doing rehabs. I'm already in the trenches. Uh, yeah, it just makes a, a whole lot of sense. No, hundred percent. It's the, the online world the, the, you know, it might not be for everybody. Right. But I think in the, the way the economy is going, we should all have side hustles. We should all have things we're interested in real estate investing. I, I love the tangibility of it. We've talked a lot about the maintenance, the, this is a, a solid thing that people need to live in. It's so basic, it's so primal. And then on the other side of things, the modern economy, the digital economy, the it, it's it's you should have if you're interested in the digital digital economy at all, you should have a foot in there as well. It's uh, yeah. you know co whether it's coding, whether it's creating content, whether it's you know on a local basis. I know people who are realtors who are starting podcasts locally yeah. as a real realtor and they're using that oh, yeah. as a marketing yeah. agency. So th there's so many ways to do it. Uh, maybe we'll leave it at that, but just it, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see what you've done and how you start with those 10, 10 videos, then you go to 20, you go to 30. Mine was very similar. I go back and look at, I was on vacation and I had a, I had a notebook and I, I, I said, I'm, I have some ideas on how uh, to explain yeah. some strategies of real estate. I had a subject to strategy and seller financing, and it was so painful to watch how slowly I talked about it. It took me forever. <laughs> but those videos have, you know, tens of thousands, 50,000, 100,000 yeah. views now. Um, for me, in, back in 2010, me putting a little, you know, a little basic, a little notebook drawing of, <laughs> of, of my real estate investing analysis. Right. So it's, it's fun. It's fun to see that, uh, that grow for sure. Absolutely. 
Well, well, this has been fun, Scott. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing your wisdom on real estate investing, on properties in general. Um, I want to give. I'm going to put links to everything, including the the, the marketing, the the maintenance checklist that you, you yeah. talked about. We'll have that. That's, be that'll good. be awesome. And also to your YouTube channel. Um, there, if you have anything else you'd like to to plug or let people know about, just as a final final call, let me. Uh, want to give you the chance to do that as well. And now that's it. Yeah. Everyday Home Repairs. Uh, that is the brand. Uh, so, you know, the Facebook group, the Facebook page, the the YouTube channel, of course, Everyday Home Repairs in Espanol, if you're a native Spanish speaker, Jeez. is out there too. So 100 videos with Spanish voiceover. <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually been watching a few of those videos to practice my Spanish. So thank you. Thank you for <laughs> <Nice>. doing that. <laughs> nice. Um, and if you guys need to get in contact with me, uh, Instagram is my smallest following by far. So you could just uh, you can add me everyday home repairs on Instagram and DM me and I'll get right back to you. So this has been great, Scott. Thank you so much. And look forward to staying in touch and getting and talking to you again soon. Thanks, buddy. All right. See you. Take care. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Scott. One of my big takeaways was just getting into the nitty gritty is very helpful. And so Scott just automatically went into just the specifics of like, what kind of faucet should you be replacing it with? What kind of gutter downspout should you have? And it's sort of a signal to me and something I want to do more on the show, which please give me some feedback on this, is to talk more about those nitty gritty details of owning rental properties. In the past and still in the future as well, I've talked a lot about acquiring properties, about analyzing deals. That's going to be a solid part of what I continue to produce content on. But I do want to talk more about those of you who already own rental properties. What are the best practices? How do you maintain your properties? How do you work with property managers? How do you decide to sell a rental property? How do you use rental properties to increase the cash flow to live off of? All those very practical things that we as small and mighty investors need to know about and need to discuss with, and we need to interview people who have good experience with that, who can help us out. So give me some feedback. I asked for it earlier when I was talking to Scott. Leave me an email at podcast at coachcarson.com. Let me know your feedback on topics you would love to have as a rental investor. And then also, if you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Would love to hear from you there as well. I'll have more interviews coming to you in the near future related to rental properties and more. In fact, this week, later on, I'll have a new Ask Coach episode about the eviction process. If you ever wanted to know the steps of an eviction, in case you ever had to do that, it's not something you want to have to do. Um, I have a new video coming up about that soon in a podcast episode. So stay tuned. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.